I want to draw your attention to the passage that was read. John chapter 4, um, 43 to 54, where Jesus healed a nobleman's son. This story I have entitled, well, this message I have entitled, Take Jesus at His Word. We just, the last verse of Speak, O Lord, sir. Um, may we stand on your promises, right? Take Jesus at his word. Now, this story has more to do with prayer than often meets the eye. It is a story about a prayerful father. When you engage Jesus with a request, that is a prayer. When you engage Jesus with a request to heal your son, that is a prayer. This is a story about a prayerful father who demonstrated faith and Jesus healed his son. As I reflected on the story, I looked at Jamaica and I said to myself, what would happen if more fathers agonized in prayer for their sons and demonstrated their faith in Jesus' ability to deliver? Wouldn't we have a new and different Jamaica? I don't believe we would have so much murder and mayhem if more fathers prayed for their sons. But the truth be told, a lot of fathers are passive and they don't intentionally seek the best physically and spiritually um, for their sons. They don't do a good job of that. Some of them don't even really business with that. And as we look at this passage, I have three points that I want to make. I'm going to tell you them um, in advance. Sometimes that's not a wise thing for a pastor to do because some people are going to say, how am I take so long on that point? When am I going to reach the other two? But I'm telling you because I want you to have a frame of reference in your mind when you leave here. I'm going to talk about the agonizing petition. Then I'm going to talk about the anemic posture. And then I'm going to talk about the awesome power. So let's look at the points. The agonizing petition. This story is framed in the context of Jesus' second time being at Cana in Galilee. Since his ministry began, his public ministry. You would remember well, I'm sure, that it was in Cana of Galilee that Jesus turned water into wine. And perhaps by now, more persons knew of that miracle. Jesus' good name and reputation had perhaps by this time gone ahead of him. And this unnamed nobleman who was based in Capernaum had heard that Jesus was coming to town and he set out to meet him. He left Capernaum to travel to Cana in Galilee. And by my rough calculations, that's roughly 25 miles. It's roughly the distance between Mandeville and Maypen. I don't know how he got to Cana. He might have walked. He might have traveled on a horse-driven carriage. He might have ridden a horse. The story doesn't tell us. But what we know is that it was a significant bit of travel. The question I want to pose is, how far are you prepared to go to meet with Jesus? How far are you prepared to go to meet with Jesus? How far are you willing to go to meet with Jesus? Could I challenge you to get up an hour earlier to meet with Jesus in the mornings? Could I challenge you to devote five minutes at lunchtime to meet with Jesus? Could I challenge you to lock off the television one evening and instead, go and meet with Jesus. How far are you willing to go to meet with Jesus? This nobleman traveled a significant distance for one reason and one reason only. To meet with Jesus. The word translated nobleman could also be translated royal official. Indeed, that's how the NIV, which was read earlier, renders that word that is used in other translations as a nobleman. Scholars believe that the man in this story was a high-ranking member of the staff of King Herod Antipas. 
So this was a man of some influence. He was a man of some financial means. This was a man with no contacts. But the man had a sick son. Sick to the point where the son was at death's door. Presumably, he had carried the boy to every reputable doctor. Presumably, he had carried the boy to the best places where he could get medical help. And he had utilized every known remedy to get the boy well. And interestingly, too, the word used for boy in the context, some scholars infer from it that it was not just the nobleman's son, but that it was the nobleman's only child. And if that was so, then the nobleman is a desperate man. This is a man in real agony. This man had reached the end of his tether. The man had reached the end, his wit's end. His influence could not help him. His money could not help him. His contacts could not help him. And he came to the conclusion that only one man could help him. Only one man could assist him. And he brought his burden to Jesus. He brought his care to Jesus. He poured out his soul to Jesus. Have you reached the place in your life where you realize that when it comes to your soul, money can't help you? Your contacts can't help you? And it's only Jesus who can help you? Have you reached the place in your life where the problems are so weighty and you have tried every, every option available to you, but it's only Jesus who can help you? This nobleman is a model of a man for us today. He took his cares, the biggest issues, the thing weighing him down, he took it to Jesus. One of the reasons there are so many madmen walking up and down the streets of Jamaica is that men tend to bottle up them sorrows. They bottle up their burdens. They bottle up their worries instead of carrying them to Jesus. Well, does the apostle Peter say, 1 Peter 5, 7, Cast all your care upon him, for he careth for you. Prayer is casting all your cares upon Jesus. Prayer is casting all your burdens upon Jesus. Prayer is casting all your anxieties upon Jesus. Prayer is casting all your worries upon Jesus. Some of you here have a son who is sick with sin. Take it to Jesus, no? Some of you here have a daughter who is sick with sin. Take it to Jesus. Some of your children grew up in church. They were even baptized, but they're not walking with the Lord. What if you do? Take it to Jesus. Some of you here, your husband is not a Christian and you have prayed for him for years. Still keep praying. Take it to Jesus. One of the things I like about this nobleman, he did not know what to do, but at least he knew where to go. He took the issues that were of greatest concern to him, his sick son, sick unto death, he took that issue to Jesus. Verse 47 tells us, when he heard that Jesus had come out of Judea into Galilee, he went to him and implored him to come down and heal his son, for he was at the point of death. He knew where to go because people were talking about Jesus. He knew where to take his son because people were talking about Jesus. Perhaps these were people who had seen Jesus work miracles. Perhaps these were people who were present at the wedding at Galilee. One of the reasons people turn and go in the wrong direction for help is that they don't hear us Christians talking about Jesus. Could it be that Christians today are no longer amazed at the amazing grace of Jesus Christ? Could it be that Christians are not talking about Jesus anymore for whatever reason? This nobleman of a father, out of concern for his son, took the matter of his son's well-being to Jesus. This father, in agonizing for his son, took the issue to Jesus. A number of us in this fellowship, we have been agonizing for a long time because we're not happy with what we see happening in terms of the spiritual and numerical growth in the children and the young people. 
And it is for that reason why we have launched this 40 days of prayer for our children and young people. You see, when we don't know what to do, we at least know where to go. We take it to Jesus. We are agonizing about our young people. And we believe Jesus is still in the business of rescuing and bringing healing and restoration. And so we are crying out to him. And we're going to keep crying out to him until the breakthrough comes. So this father had an agonizing petition. But there is also an anemic posture. Anemic means in the sense of weak and frail. Notice verse 48. Then Jesus said to him, Unless you people see signs and wonders, you will by no means believe. This nobleman's understanding of Jesus and his healing ministry was weak. It was frail. It was anemic. The nobleman knew where to go, but he did not have the right approach. Look at verse 47. When he heard that Jesus had come out of Judea into Galilee, he went to him and implored him to come down and heal his son, to come down and heal his son. The nobleman was limiting Jesus. No, the nobleman believed that unless Jesus physically showed up at the bedside of his son, then no healing would take place. With that attitude, the nobleman was dumbing down Jesus. With that attitude, the nobleman was limiting Jesus. So often we as Christians, we create Jesus in our own image. So often as Christians, we place limitations on Jesus. Sometimes we tough it up because we say to ourselves, there's nothing Jesus can do to help me. Sometimes we don't even bother to pray because we believe the problem bigger than Jesus. This man, by the nature of his requests, was undermining the power of Jesus. Yet in this verse, there's a clue that the man was a Jew, not a Gentile, and we said, because Jesus said to him, unless you people see signs and wonders, you will by no means believe. Um, Paul writing in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 22, says that the Jews always seek for a sign. This is such a contrast to the Samaritans. You remember we looked at the woman at the well not so long ago. The Samaritans were not of pure Jewish blood, but they had Jewish blood. They were mixed up with Assyrians and Greeks and other ethnicities. Look back to what we discussed about the woman at the well. Jesus met the woman. Jesus did not show her any signs, but she still believed. Jesus just told her everything about herself. Jesus showed her who she really was. Jesus showed her her need for living water. And her response was, come see a man who told me all things that I ever did. Could this be the Christ? When she asked that question, she really knew that is a Christ. But she's coaching it in that way. Then they went out of the city to come to him. And many of the Samaritans of that city believed in Jesus because of the word of the woman who testified, he told me all that I ever did. So when the Samaritans had come to him, they urged him to stay with them. And he stayed there two days. And many more believed because of his own word. No signs, just the word. Then they said to the woman, No, we believe, not because of what you said. For we ourselves have heard him. And we know that this is indeed the Christ, the Savior of the world. So the Samaritans were people who did not crave signs and wonders. They simply took Jesus at his word. They just believed Jesus. They placed their trust and their confidence in Jesus. They surrendered their lives to Jesus. But not the Jews. Jews look for a sign. And even when they get the signs, them still not believe. John 3 begins with these words. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews, this man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you're a teacher come from God. For no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. But when Jesus finished explaining the gospel to Nicodemus, Nicodemus didn't surrender his life to the Lord Jesus Christ then. 
We have reason to believe that he later did. But in the moment, he did not surrender his life to the Lord. Nicodemus knew of the signs that Jesus had done. But that did not lead immediately to his conversion. Jesus said in John 6, 26, after the feeding of the 5,000, Most assuredly, I say to you, you seek me not because you saw the signs, but because you ate of the loaves and were filled. In other words, I want more food. <laughs> the Apostle John records in John 12, 37, But although he had done so many signs before them, they did not believe in him. Some did indeed believe in Jesus because of the signs, but the overwhelming majority did not. There are still some people, if Jesus heal you, if Jesus rescue you from the financial pit you are in, if Jesus bring healing and harmony to your family life, if he does the impossible for you, you still now surrender your life to Jesus, even though he has done signs and wonders. Don't raise your hand if that is you. The main emphasis of the book of John is not the signs. The main emphasis in the book of John is who the signs point to. His name is Jesus. The main emphasis of the book of John is that you can believe in the Son of God. He's able to save you from your sins. There were times when Jesus showed up at people's houses and did healing, yes. But the real anemic posture of this nobleman was that he wanted Jesus to do a sign miracle by coming to his house. What the Apostle John, in writing this gospel, wants us to see is that the nobleman was underrating Jesus' power to heal. The nobleman was underrating Jesus' power to heal. The nobleman stands in strong contrast to the centurion we read about in Matthew 8, verses 5 to 13. And when Jesus had entered Capernaum, a centurion came to him. This is not a Jew now. A centurion came to him, pleading with him, saying, Lord, my servant is lying at home paralyzed, dreadfully tormented. And Jesus said to him, I will come and heal him. The centurion answered and said, Lord, I am not worthy for you should, that you should come under my, roof, work, under my roof, but only speak a word and my servant will be healed. For I am a man under authority, having soldiers under me. And I say to this one, go, and he goes, and to another, come, and he comes. And to my servant, do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard it, he marveled and said to those who followed, Assuredly, I say to you, I have not found such great faith, not even in Israel. Then Jesus said to the centurion, Go your way, and as you have believed, so let it be done for you. And his servant was healed that same hour. So the centurion was in effect saying to Jesus, Lord, you are not a servant, you are the master. You just speak the word and my servant would be healed. You don't need to come to my house to heal anybody. You can stay right where you are and say something and heal my servant. What's the lesson for us here? Brethren, when we approach Jesus in prayer, don't put limitations on Jesus. Don't think that Jesus always has to act in this way or that. Jesus has multiple ways of healing people. Sometimes he laid hands on a person. Sometimes he spoke the word. One time he placed mud on the eyes of a blind man. Sometimes he cast out demons. Don't limit Jesus. If you limit Jesus, you are assuming an anemic posture. If you limit Jesus, you are diminishing your faith to have your prayers answered. The Bible says when you approach Jesus, ask in confidence. Matthew 7, 7 and 8. Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find Knock and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and he who seeks finds, and to him who knocks it will be opened. Here's my third point the awesome power. The agonizing position, the anemic posture, 
the awesome power. Verse 50. Jesus said to him, the nobleman, go your way, your son lives. So the man believed the word that Jesus spoke to him. So the man believed the word that Jesus spoke to him. And he went his way. And as he was now going down, his servants met him and told him, saying, your son lives. Then he inquired of them the hour when he got better. And they said to him, yesterday at the seventh hour, the fever left him. So the father knew that it was at the same hour in which Jesus said to him, your son lives. And he, he himself believed and his whole household. When we take our prayers to Jesus, Jesus has awesome power to answer our prayers. Sometimes we are in danger of forgetting that Jesus is able to answer our prayers. You know, prayer can be just very routine. You just mouth words, but there, it, there's no connection with the heart. You're just going through the motions. But it's important for us as believers to always engage the heart and the mind and the soul and the spirit when we pray. And pray with expectancy. Pray, pray expecting that the Lord is indeed going to answer the prayer. We read of a super powerful word of Jesus in Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 3. You know it well. Um, verse 1 to 3. God who at various times and in various ways spoke in times past to the fathers by the prophets. Has in these last days spoken to us by his son whom he has appointed here of all things, through whom also he made the worlds, and who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, and upholding all things by the word of his power. You got that? And upholding not a few things, not some things, but all things by the word of of his power. The air that you breathe belongs to Jesus. The strength in your body belongs to Jesus. The water that you drink belongs to Jesus. He has the power to make the rough places plain. He has the power to make the crooked straight. He has the power to exalt valleys. He has the power to bring down mountains. It was he who parted the Red Sea when the Israelites got over. They sang, who is like unto thee, O Lord, among gods. When we come to God in prayer, we often end the prayer in Jesus' name. We end that way because we are laying claim on the awesome power and might of Jesus to do the impossible and to make a way where there seems to be no way. Jesus merely spoke the word and the boy was healed. What a God. What a Savior. What we need are not signs and wonders. What we need is the word. All kinds of people are running around for signs and wonders. Some even go as far as St. Thomas to check a certain man. Some check out the Indian people them, them see on TV who can read palm. So them say. <laughs> what we need are not signs and wonders. What we need is confidence in the word of the Lord. We must be a people who put a premium on the word of the Lord. Andre Crouch years ago wrote a song, we need to hear from you. We need a word from you. If we don't hear from you, what will we do? Jesus said in John 5, 39, search the scriptures, for in them ye think ye have eternal life, and they, the scriptures, are they which testify of me. If you want to really know Jesus, don't bank on signs and wonders. Place your trust in his written word. The written word testifies to the living word. The psalm is said in Psalm 138, I will worship toward the holy temple and praise thy name for thy loving kindness and for thy truth. For thou hast magnified thy word above thy name. We must increasingly become a people of the word. That is why Christians need to come to Bible study. 
to learn about God's super powerful word, to learn from God's sufficient word. When God speaks, I that you know. When God speaks, that is it. You got me? When God, there used to be a saying, God says it, I believe it, that settles it. That, but I'm going to go one better. God says it, that settles it. You do well to believe it. But if God says it, that settles it. Argument done. We don't need to second guess when Jesus speaks. We read in John 4, 51 and following, and as he was now going down, this nobleman's servant met him and told him, your son lives. Then he inquired of them the hour when he got better. And they said to him, yesterday at the seventh hour, which largely corresponds to 1 p.m., the fever left him. Yesterday at the seventh hour, 1 p.m., the fever left him. So the father knew that it was at that same hour in which Jesus said to him, your son lives. Cana, as we said, is roughly 25 miles from Capernaum. Verse 52 tells us that the father got the news of his son's healing a day after the healing. Verse 52 says, then he inquired of them the hour when he got better. And they said to him, yesterday at the seventh hour. Now, I don't believe it takes 24 hours to walk 25 miles. So, how come... So what, I want to suggest to you that the man took Jesus at his word and went about his business. I want to suggest to you that the man took Jesus at his word and went about his business. Jesus said to him, go your way, your son lives. Permit me a little holy imagination. He took Jesus at his word and then went shopping. He took Jesus at his word and then went to the civil service meeting in Cana. He took Jesus at his word and went to visit his aunties in Cana. He took Jesus at his word and went to buy a gift for his son. He took Jesus at his word and went to the Cana Business Expo. He took the anxieties he had concerning his son and rested in the word of Jesus. What Jesus had to say to him was sufficient. What he received from Jesus was a sufficient word. When Jesus speaks to you, that is a sufficient word. Paul said in Galatians 1.18, But even if we are an angel from heaven, Preach any other word, any other gospel to you than what the word we have preached to you. Let him be accursed. Jesus' word is a sufficient word, brethren. You don't need to add to it. You don't need to dilute it. You just need to receive it. Psalm 19 verses 7 to 11 says this of the word of God. The law of the Lord is perfect. Speaking of the word. Is converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgment of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, yea, than much fine gold. Sweeter also than honey and the honeycomb. Moreover, by them your servant is warned. And in keeping them, there is great reward. The word of Jesus is a super powerful word. The word of Jesus is a sufficient word. And the word of Jesus is a salvation word. It's a salvific word. The word of Jesus is not merely there to bring about physical healing. The word of Jesus is not... They are merely to instruct in moral principles. The word of Jesus is God's means to expose sinners to their need for salvation. The word of Jesus and the working of the Holy Spirit are God's means to convict and to convert sinners. Verse 53 said, So the father knew that it was at the same hour in which Jesus said to him, Your son lives. And then notice this. And he himself believed. Not just him, 
and his whole household. You got that? When the gospel writer uses the word believe, he does not merely mean head knowledge. When John writes and uses the word believe, he does not merely mean head knowledge. He uses the word believes to point out what it is that is entailed in a surrendered life to Christ. He means that one has repented of one's sins. He means one has come to terms with the, with the wretchedness of one's sinfulness. He means that one has come to terms with the fact that only Christ can save one from one's sin. Otherwise, one is heading to hell. He means that unless Christ saves you, you will one day bear the full wrath of God as judgment on sinners in a place called hell. He means that one has turned over one's life to Jesus. It means that one has said to Jesus, Jesus, do with my life as you please. My life is no longer my own. My life now belongs to you. This noble man surrendered his life to Jesus. It is a noble thing to surrender your life to Jesus. There's nothing more noble for a man, for a woman, for a boy, for a girl to do than to surrender his or her life to Jesus. And God in his grace so worked on the life of this man's family that they too turned over their lives to Jesus. There's something to be said here about ministry to men. And there are lots of statistics out there that prove the point I'm going to make. That when a man gets saved and serious about Jesus, it is extremely probable, more than 90% probable, that the rest of the family is going to follow. Right? When the man gets saved and loves Jesus and is on fire for Jesus, the wife going to get saved, the children going to get saved. That is why I believe, as Christians, as, as churches, we must intentionally go after the man. When you get the man, when, and Jesus gets a hold of that man, and you disciple him properly, his wife is coming to Jesus, his son is coming to Jesus, his daughter is coming to Jesus. The awesome word of Jesus brought healing to the nobleman's son, and it also brought salvation to the nobleman and his family, including the boy who was healed. The nobleman responded positively to Jesus' word, and it brought salvation to him and to his family. We must respond in obedience to the word of Jesus. If we want to see Jamaica turned upside down for Jesus, we must respond obediently and confidently to the word of Jesus Christ. So let me wrap up. Jesus used the sickness of the nobleman's son to get his attention. Jesus sometimes uses hardships, sicknesses, to get our attention. Christ got that nobleman's attention by allowing his son to get ill. Could it be that you are facing severe difficulties in your life? Could it be that Jesus is trying to get your attention? Could it be that is why you lost your job? That is why your business failed. That is why your health failed. Could it be that is why your children are giving you worries? Could it be that Jesus is trying to get your attention? Will you dare to have faith and believe in this Jesus? The healing of the body is important, but the healing of the soul is of paramount importance. Maybe there's someone here today, you know your soul is sick with sin. But you want a change of life. Jesus wants to heal your sin-sick soul. Maybe there's someone here today. You're not a Christian. Jesus wants to give you salvation. Maybe you're one of those who love signs and wonders and you're chasing after signs and wonders. Stop chasing after them. And take Jesus at his word. Let me issue an invitation to you all. Is there anybody 
under the sound of my voice in the sanctuary or the annex. You are not a Christian. You don't know Christ as your Savior and Lord. But today, you'd like to turn over your life to God. You'd like to turn over your life to Jesus Christ. You'd like to ask him to forgive you of your sins and take full control of your life. And thereafter, you pledge by God's help and enablement and his grace and his spirit to walk with Jesus the rest of your days. Is there anybody like that? Could you signal by an upraised hand? Anybody like that? Nobody like that here under the sound of my voice? Well, let me make the appeal to my online friends. Our contact details are on the screen, and we are eager to reach out to you. So let us know how this word affected you, and if it is that you want to come to know Christ as your Lord and Savior, we will be happy to show you from God's word, to reach out to you, to call you, to make contact with you, and show you how you too can come to know Jesus and receive salvation from sin. May the Lord bless this meditation to your heart as you continue to live for his glory. Amen.